Okay, let's get started. A couple of uh, very quick announcements. One is there's no class Wednesday. So you probably already know that. I just want to emphasize that you don't show up here. Right? Um, the other is your mystery project is due by 5 p.m. today. I already have probably six or seven submissions, maybe no, maybe five when I left this morning. So by 5 p.m., please get your mystery project. And you will not get the graded version until after 5 p.m. So even those of you who sent it yesterday and today, I, I will hold off sending you your feedback and your grade till after 5 p.m. So if you've already sent it, you haven't got it back, that's the reason. The last is your uh, third lecture note packet is available to pick up up here. I've, I've put, made two slides per page, and for some it's kind of tough to read when you have two slides on a page. The full version is actually on the website, so if you want to download the single page, it's there. So I just didn't want to send it to the bookstore and make copies and have everybody doing it with, you know, with Thanksgiving coming up. So basically I made the copies myself. So sometime today, we will start on Lecture Note Packet 3. Okay? But before we do that, let me finish, uh, put the, the finishing touches on private company valuation. Talking about illiquidity, when, I left, when we left off last session, we talked about how when you buy a private business, the cost of buyer's remorse is huge. In other words, if you change your mind after you buy a publicly traded stock and you decide to sell it 15 minutes later, it's not such a big deal. But with private businesses, it is a big deal. And that's why when you buy a private business, you've got to build into the value that expectation that you will have buyer's remorse. That's what the discount is. So let me start off with a very, very simple intuitive test of what drives that discount. Let's say you have a very healthy publicly traded company with shares trading at $10 per share. So I come to you, <coughs> I come to you and I offer you 10,000 shares in this company with a catch, which is, you cannot trade these shares for the next year. So I've locked up your shares for a year. So you know the price. You know that you cannot trade for a year. What discount would you demand for the lack of liquidity? A, no discount. B, 5%. So pick an answer based on your gut. And let's see where this goes. So remember, it's a healthy, well-managed, profitable company. Pick a number. No? There's no right answer. I just want to get a sense of what you would charge for this discount. Then let me ask you a follow-up question. If this company were a poorly managed company and there were significant financial issues, would you demand a larger discount or a smaller discount? What do you think? I would think you'd demand a larger discount. Essentially, I want to lay the foundations for thinking about liquidity, that it should it won't be the same for every company. It should vary across companies. It'll probably vary across buyers. For instance, some of you might have demanded a smaller discount than others simply because you didn't feel that you would have buyer's remorse. The longer your time horizon, the less you worry about changing your mind, the smaller your discount is going to be. And that's basically what I was talking about last session is a liquidity can't be a fixed number. It's got to vary across buyers. It's got to vary across companies. It's got to vary across time. Now, let's go follow up to this. Today, we're also going to talk about that special case where you're valuing a private business for an initial public offering. Okay. Let's assume you're the founder or owner of a social media company. You're planning a public offering. The investment bankers have valued your company at $10 per share. So let, no, let's not even open the box to see how they, but let's say that's the value. And they plan to issue the shares at $8 per share. If you are offering 100% of your shares on the offering day, which almost never happens. But let's say you decide to sell your entire stake. Would you go along with this? In fact, if you go along with this, do you see the cost you're bearing because of the underpricing? How much are you giving up? You're basically giving up 20% of your ownership value. Why? So that the investment bank has an easier time selling these shares. That's basically it, right? But we know that in most IPOs, you don't sell 100%. In fact, today we're going to talk about what the typical offering date is going to be. If you're offering only 5% of your shares in the offering date, would you as a founder own have a very different view of this discount? Why might you go along if you're offering only 5%? What do you get when you offer that 5%? The shares are at $8. Assuming they're priced, the valued right, what should happen on the offering date? You're going to see a jump in the price, right? Next day, there's a Wall Street Journal article saying X, no, XYZ company sees big jump. 
This is like, you know, you know what lost leaders are in stores? You walk in, especially around Christmas, there's this table filled with cheap stuff. They're selling below cost, but basically they suck you deeper and deeper into the store. And by the time you get to that fourth table, you're in the Ralph Lauren section where nothing is discounted. What they want you to do is spend your money on the expensive stuff. And they use the loss leaders to suck you in. Today we're going to talk about some of the evidence in IPOs. And people get puzzled. Why do you see this underpricing at the time of the IPO? But if you factor in what's actually offered at the time of the, at, on that initial date, you can very quickly see that it's stage man, that you'd like it to be staged. So once in a while, you do screw up, like you do in the Facebook IPO. But investment bankers try to stage manage that offering date, hoping it'll lead up to better things in the future. Hoping, you can't guarantee it. But that's something we're going to talk about today. How do you value an IPO? How do you manage that initial offering? Why do you set the discount up front? What happens afterwards? Okay. So let's turn to. I think we were on slide 119. And I was talking about how private company appraisers came up with the liquidity discount. I said many of them look at restricted stock studies. And restricted stock studies are just like the example I told you, where I offer you shares, but you're not allowed to trade for a year or two years or three years. So what you get to observe is what the discount is at the time of the restricted stock. Or, or, and many of these studies find big discounts, 15, 20, 25, 30% discounts. And until about 10 or 15 years ago, that was the par. So if you were valuing a private business, you just knocked 25%, and you backed it up with these restricted stock studies. Then I showed you, I think the very last thing, I showed you the, the silver study of restricted stock discounts, where he related the discount on a restricted stock issue to the specific characteristics of the company. How big the company was, whether it was making money, you know, how big the block was. So basically, his argument was the discount. There is a discount, but the discount seems to vary across companies. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take this regression that Bill Silver ran. Oh, it's about 23 years old. And I'm going to use it to kind of finesse the discount to, so that I can come up with different discounts for different companies. Before I do this, though, a couple of things to remember. One is he did have this dummy variable for earnings, right? If it was positive, he put in one. If it was negative, it was zero. And he found that the discount was larger for money-losing companies. How much larger? The coefficient on that dummy variable tells me how much larger. He also found that the larger the revenues of the company, the smaller the discount. So what I did actually was I took that regression and I calculated how much every $10 million or $50 million in additional revenues translates into a new discount and whether you're making money. So the way I would use this table is you tell me what your revenues are as a private company and whether you're making money or losing money. I use the silver regression, starting with a base of 25%. So I use that as my base discount. So if your revenues are much larger than my, than my base revenues, then I'm going to lower the discount. If you're losing money, I'm going to raise the discount. So here's how I'd use it. You tell me that your revenues are, let's say, 50 million and you're losing money, then the discount I'm going to attach to you is about 32%. If you have revenues of 50 million and you're making money, your discount is only 22%. So your discount is larger if you're a money-losing company, smaller if you're a money-making company. It's larger if you're a big company, small, I'm sorry, it's smaller if you're a big company, larger if you're a small company. And I'm going to use that silver regression. To, it's building a lot on one regression, but it tells you one way in which you can adapt the discount to make it different for different companies. So that's one path to take, is to take those restricted stock studies and try to extract as much information as you can so you can vary across companies. I also told you that the other way in which um, people come up with these discounts is to look at IPOs. And they look at transactions just before the IPO to see owners selling and buying from each other. And they figure out what the discount is. And I'll be quite honest, I don't believe any of these numbers. I mean, you look at these numbers. It looks like people are selling their shares six weeks, eight weeks before an IPO for 35 to 40% less than what they could make by holding on. You know what that tells me? There's something wrong with these studies. Something is missing. There's some sampling bias, something that's causing these numbers. Because think about it. If you're a, you and I are co-owners of a business, we plan to go public in eight weeks. We have a sense that we're going to get $10 per share. There's no way you're going to sell your share to me for $6 per share, unless you're worried about something, right? 
In fact, I'll tell you my biggest problem with these IPO studies. You know how, how they run? They take companies that actually do IPOs. Then they look at transactions that happen in the three months before the IPO. See what the sampling bias is going to be? Do all companies that plan to do IPOs actually do IPOs? What are you missing when you take companies that actually go public? You're missing all the companies that plan to go public that never made it, right? Why didn't they make it? Something went wrong. If you really want to get a sense of what the discount is, you've got to bring that part of the sample in as well. You can't select only those companies that succeeded. In fact, you can argue that in both, in both these cases, the restricted stock studies and the IPO studies, you've got a sampling problem. It's always been there, but nobody ever brought it up. You know why? Because the private company appraisers wanted big discounts. They were happy that these studies delivered the big discounts. They would go to court and say, look, look, we have a study. It shows that the discount of 35% is OK. And for a long time, courts agreed with them, until about 10 years ago. Who's losing money from all of these big discounts? What did I say these, these, these discounts are used to do? They're used in divorce court or tax court, right? Let's take tax court, which is actually the bulk of these appraisals. So when these big discounts are applied, what's happening is the taxpayer is claiming that his business is worth only $3 million instead of $5 million paying less in taxes, right? The IRS for a long time was really cheap, cheap about hiring expert witnesses on their own side. So what would happen is the taxpayer would hire this expensive expert witness with the study. He says, look, the study says 35%. The IRS would say, no, no, that's too big, but they would not have anything to count. But 10 years ago, they finally you know, ponied up the money to get an expert witness who could contest these studies on a sampling basis. So he came in with a sampling study. And actually, he showed that if you just took the companies that issue restricted stock and you looked at them, there were basket cases. Only really bad companies issue restricted stock. Because why else would he take a 35% discount on value? So if he took out the sampling effect, he estimated that out of the 30 or 35% discount, you see only 10% was for liquidity. The remaining 25% was a sampling effect. So the first time in court you had this, con this, this argument. So you know what the court did? So 35% is what the expert witness for the taxpayer says. 10% is what the IRS claims. So what do you think the court decided to use? Halfway down the middle. It's the stupidest way you can break these ties. Because you know what's, what it's going to create, right? Over time, the expert witnesses are both going to pull away in opposite directions knowing the court is going to split the difference. But at least for the first time, the court recognized that there's a sampling bias in these studies and that you might not be able to trust them. But people still use them. There's a cottage industry of people who run these studies purely for appraisers. Okay? So the question is, what else can you do? We said that public companies, when you have buyer's remorse, the cost is not that much. right? But there is a cost. If you buy shares on whatever your, your brokerage, you know, I don't know what online brokerage you use, you buy 1,000 shares, and one minute later you sell their shares, you know what your cost is, right? First, there's that $9 each, trans the transaction cost. What else is that? Even if the price doesn't change? You buy at a price, you sell at, even if the price hasn't changed, there's a bid-ask spread. So if you think about it, the bid-ask spread is the a liquidity discount for a public company. Now, if I took a company like IBM or Cisco, a very heavily traded stock, the bid-ask spread is tiny as a percent of the price. It might be $0.10 cents on a $100 stock price. So it's tiny, but it's not zero. But if I took a NASDAQ stock that is not very heavily traded, in fact, it's a very lightly traded stock, you could have a $2 share with a $0.50 cent bid-ask spread. In effect, you have a 25% illiquidity discount with that share. You know where I'm going to go with this? What's my trouble with these studies? They're small samples, and they're biased, right? I'd like a much larger, unbiased sample. And if every publicly traded stock has a bid-ask spread, why shouldn't I take that spread as a percentage of the price? Call that the illiquidity discount for a public company and see what causes the spread to be different for different public companies. So about 10 years ago, that's what I did. I took every pub publicly traded US stock. I took the spread, divided by the price to get a percentage. And I ran a regression of the spread against the level of revenues. So it's very similar to the silver regression, but now I have thousands of companies in my sample. 
against whether it's making money, how much cash the company has, because that's a liquid asset, and what the trading volume of the company was. So essentially, it's a cross-sectional sectional regression across publicly traded companies. Once I run this regression, I have this output, right? Now you come to me with a private business, say, what's my liquidity discount? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to plug your company's revenues into this regression. Your company, whether it's making money or losing money, into the dummy variable. How much cash your company has, but you're a private business, that's like a public company that never trades. I'm going to put a zero trading volume. So I'm going to plug a private company's numbers into this bid-ask spread regression. I'm going to come up with a predicted bid-ask spread for your private company, which is really your predicted illiquidity discount. That's exactly what I did for the restaurant. I took the bludgeon approach, where I took what the appraisers did. The second approach, I adjusted that 25% for the fact that this restaurant is making money, but it's a small restaurant. Okay? And in the third, I plugged the numbers in the bid ask spread regression. My discount actually is 25% with the first approach, 28.75% when I adjust for the small revenues. And when I use the bid ask spread, my discount is only 13%. That's the discount that I think is most reasonable if I'm the restaurant owner, which if I apply to the 521,000 I estimate as a value of equity, gives me a value of equity of 454,000. So three very different ways of getting the liquidity discount, a fixed number that applies across all companies, a number adjusted for your revenues and whether you're making money using the silver regression, and the third is the bid-ask spread regression, three different numbers. And I think increasingly I would like to move towards a bit aspirate regression. The only thing is I haven't updated this regression in 10 years because it was a huge pain in the neck when I first did it. So if any of you decide to go into private company valuation, I'll tell you how to do it and I'll set you started. But it's, it's going to take you a couple of weeks to just collect the data and run it. But then you can use it for a year and then you have to update it again. It's well worth the effort if this is what you do essentially as a living is valuing private business. Any questions? Right. So you're the owner of the restaurant, the chef. So I come to you and say your restaurant is worth only four. If, so if you, if you sold the restaurant, you get only four fifty-four thousand, and you're disappointed. You say that's really low. And think of why it's low. It's low because I used to total bait and a very high discount rate in the cash flows. It's low because I applied a liquidity discount at the end of the process, right? And that's because you were selling to another private individual. So here's what I'd like to do next. I'd like to talk about what would have been different for your value if instead of selling to another private buyer, you'd been selling to a publicly traded company or a public buyer. So I'm a publicly traded restaurant. I'm, I'm interested in buying your restaurant. How much should I pay? Think about what's going to be different. When I did the private to private transaction, I used to total beta because the buyer of the restaurant was not diversified, right? This has nothing to do with the seller. It's got everything to do with the buyer. Because the buyer was not diversified, I had to hike up the beta to reflect all that firm-specific risk. But if the buyer is a public company or a diversified investor, the first thing that's going to change is instead of using the total beta, I'm going to use my traditional market beta. So my cost of capital is going to look just like the cost of capital for a public company, which makes a big difference. So 13.25% is my cost of capital. I'm going to use 8.76%. So the first difference is I'm going to use a much lower cost of capital, which is going to push up the value. Second, why did I attach an illiquidity discount when I was a private buyer? Because I was worried that once I bought the restaurant, I wouldn't be able to trade it, right? But if I'm buying this restaurant as a public company, even though the restaurant cannot be traded, the, the company itself can be traded. So if I'm a public company, I'm not attaching an illiquidity to discount individual assets because investors can buy and sell my shares in the marketplace. So the two things that are going to change is one, instead of using the cost of capital of a, pri of a private business, I'm using the cost of capital of a public company. The second is, there is no liquidity discount. If I make those two changes, instead of paying you only 453,880, which is what I did under the old scenario, you're now going to get almost a million and a half for exactly the same equity stake in the same business. It's actually kind of, you know, if you, if you look at those two numbers, and you're the owner of a private business, and you see those two numbers, what's the first implication that comes about? If you're trying to sell your business, and you're looking for potential buyers, go looking for a public company as a potential buyer. You're going to get a much higher value than if you can get a private buyer. 
So if you're a doctor trying to sell a practice, you can sell it to another doctor, which is the conventional route, but if you can sell to a publicly traded company that owns lots of practices, you're going to get a much higher number. If you're a pharmacist, you own your own pharmacy, you can look for somebody to sell the pharmacy to. Or you can sell it to CVS because of this nice location, you're going to get a much higher value. It's kind of a depressing afterthought here, right? Because if you follow through on this process and you look at the implications, over time, private companies are going to be bought out by public companies because you can't compete. I mean, this applies not just for businesses, for sports teams. Increasingly, you're going to see this happen to what used to be private businesses. Is they're going to be held by public companies? Yes, Robin. You've got to be very careful. You're a public company. The minute you start thinking about illiquidity to discounts, you're in big trouble. Because if you do capital budgeting, right? Let's say you're a manufacturing company. You build a plant. The plant is illiquid. But you don't apply a discount to the net present value saying the plant is illiquid. Illiquidity discounts really don't play a role the minute you become a public company and you're acquiring physical assets. Because the, what matters here is the company itself gets traded. I mean, you have to factor in whatever the macro risk is and the market risk is, but you can't be attaching a liquidity discount because if you do, there's going to be arbitrage. People are going to be able to buy the company essentially. You're not liquidating. It's a going concern. So in this case, the liquidity discount should actually go to zero the minute you talk about a public buyer. <coughs> so let's carry this to the next step. You're the owner of this restaurant. I've given you two numbers, right? One is 454,000, the other is 1,484 million, 1.484 million. Now, I know which one you'd rather get, you'd rather get, right? So you're sitting at the bargaining table. I am the potential buyer. I'm a public company. So here's my question for you. Now, when you, when you negotiate with me, which number do you think I will pay you, the 454,000? Or the one point four. So I'm in the public company. So we know that this business is worth $1.484 billion to me. But you also have this lower bound based on what, it, what it's worth if you sell to another private individual. So you walk in. Let's do the bargaining. When, I, when you walk in, what do you claim your restaurant is worth? $1.484 million. You know what I'm going to claim? I'm going to claim it's worth only $454,000. What, what am I challenging you to do? If I'm the only potential public buyer in town, I'm saying, where are you going to go? If I give you only, I'll give you 2,000 more than the 454,000, 456,000, where are you going to go? So if I am the only potential public buyer, you're sunk. You know what you're going to get? You're going to get close to 454,000. Is this fair? Life isn't fair. I'm going to walk away with the upside. In fact, this is a way in which a lot of very successful public companies were built up. This is how Blockbuster was built up as a company. 30 years ago, video rental stores used to be private businesses. Blockbuster went around the country buying out the highest profile private video rental stores, paying them more than what they could have got if they'd sold to another private buyer, but well below what it was worth to Blockbuster as a company. Browning Ferris did the same thing with waste disposal companies. They basically put these private businesses together, offering the owners more than what they could have got from a private buyer, but much less than they would have received if they would got the present value of the cash flow. Okay. It's one of the few, when we talk about acquisitions, this is one of the few cases where an acquisition-driven growth strategy actually creates value, is buying and bundling up private businesses into a public company. Okay. So. That's going to drive where you end up. And what will give you more power is if you can get two public buyers interested in you. Because if you can get two public buyers interested in you, you're going to play them off against each other. And if you can play them off against each other, you're going to get closer to the 1.484 million than if I'm the only player in town. One final question. Okay? If your best potential bidder is a private equity or a VC fund rather than a public buyer. What would be different about the number? So go back to the previous page. Think about what would be different if instead of a public company or a public buyer, you had a VC or a private equity investor. What, is the, what are the two big changes? 
We attach no liquidity discount, and we use the market beta, right? And we use the market beta because we said, if you're a public company, your investors can diversify. Therefore, I'm not going to bring in any firm-specific risk. If I'm a venture capitalist, am I more diversified than you? Yeah, right. You have, on, you have all your money invested in this one business. I am more in diversified than you are. But I'm not fully diversified because as a venture capitalist, often I have 35 companies all in the same business. Venture capitalists are more diversified than the typical private business owner, but they're not as diversified as a public company. So you know what's going to happen? Instead of being at an 8.76% cost of capital, you're going to fall somewhere between the two numbers. We'll talk about how to decide where in the somewhere, but a venture capitalist might have 11% cost of capital instead of an 8.2, which means that you're going to get a number somewhere between the 454 and the 1,484, and you're going to have the same bargaining problem, which is if this is the only venture, cap only venture capitalist in town, he might walk away with that excess value rather than you. But that's what we're going to do when we think about venture capitalists and private equity investors is think about where between the private total beta and the market beta am I going to go with this potential bar. Yes, John. Now, private equity funds have a bigger shot. So you look at a Blackstone or a KKR, you have a much better shot of seeing a diversified fund. If you look at VCs, because of the fact that many of them need localized knowledge in the companies, they tend to focus on sectors that they're comfortable with. So, the, the, so you go to the West Coast, and you go to VC firms, they tend to be either tech VC fir firms, or so, because you need that expertise often. Because as a VC, you're not just an investor, right? You help in running the company. So it's true that you could create a diversified VC. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. It's a question of whether, they ha whether they're selling, whether they're raising funds from investors or whether they're using their own money. So Kleiner Perkins might actually argue that the bulk of the money invested in the fund is their money. Okay? But the more you can open the fund up to wealthy investors, the more you could argue that you're getting closer and closer to a diversified. So that's why the continuum is going to vary depending on the VC. There are some VCs who are closer to a market beta and some VCs who are closer to a private company beta. And when they compete against each other, the more diversified VC will beat out the less diversified one. And at the limit, what did Blackstone do? They went public themselves, right? At the limit, if you go public yourself as a, as a private equity or VC, you essentially remove the disadvantage entirely. So I'd make a prediction that the most successful VCs, the most successful private equity funds will end up being public because that really evens the playing field and gives them the same bait and cost of capital as a publicly traded company. Any other questions? Yes, Christopher. In the case, for example, of Blackstone, I think yeah. it's the asset management company, which is not the, like the investors are investing in the asset management company and not in the, in the, in the fund. So they are not the, the same. See, so it really depends on how, so you can structure it in you know, lots of different ways. If you're raising money from private investors to invest in these companies, your cost of capital will be very different than if you're using your own money. Okay? So different funds are structured differently. So where you fall in the continuum, you've got to trace out where the, so it's not even who's investing, but where did they get the money to invest in this company that's going to drive where you end up between that total beta and the market beta. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a competitive advantage you can get as a fund is if you can lower your cost of equity towards that of a public company, you're capable of paying more. You might not pay more, right? Because you want to pay only as much as the next highest bidder is going to pay, but then you can keep the difference for yourself as an investor. So the game actually shifted. 20 years ago, VCs were not diversified. They were sector-driven. They invested in their own money. The game is starting to becoming, become more like a mutual fund, right? So if you look at many VCs and private equity funds, they're more like mutual funds with wealthy investors investing in them. And that changes the game a great deal in terms of cost of equity and cost of capital. Any other questions? Yes. The illiquidity discount is an interesting question. Again, if you're a VC or a private equity investor, you're going to argue that there's an illiquidity discount, right? Why? Because it allows you to get the premium. 
whether there's one will really depend on how diversified you are and what you do with the overall money. So if you're a Blackstone, there really shouldn't be an illiquidity discount because you're publicly traded. But that doesn't mean that when you see the valuations, you will not see a discount because they're going to act like there's this huge diversification problem, huge illiquidity discount because they get to keep the difference. If they gave away the entire 1, 1. 1.48 million in this case, you're not getting anything as the investor, so you want to try to keep back some of that, so you're going to see all those arguments. Right? Now let's look at a private company for an initial public offering. This is the other threat you can use, right? So if you're a private business and you go looking for buyers and they all offer you too little, then you might say, look, I'll go public. But to do this, you've got to get to a critical mass. That restaurant, for instance, can't go public. It's too small. But if you have the potential to go public, then the game changes entirely. So let's, let's look at how valuing an initial public offering is different than valuing a public company. So here's a company I'm going to use. It's a, it's a software company. It's a pretty large software company. The value that I have for the equity using a traditional discounted cash flow model is about 69.8 million or 70 million. So based on, so when you look at this valuation, it looks just like a public company valuation. Expected cash flows discounted back at a regular market cost of capital. Because once you go public, your investors can diversify. And because they can diversify, use a market beta, cost of equity, cost of capital. So when, if you're asked to value an IPO, the techniques and the processes and the models used will be exactly like valuing a public company. So let's see, though, what dimensions your valuation might be different on. And here are the things that you have to factor in when you value an IPO that you might not have to think about with a public company. First, when a company goes public, on the offering date, people buy shares, right? Cash comes in. There are two uses to which that cash can be put. One is it can be cash that owners, founders use to cash out of the company. The other is the cash can be kept in the company to meet its investment needs. You need to know where the proceeds are going before you can value a private company for an IPO. So we'll talk about how that plays out. Second, if you think about a, public, a private company going public, it's the end of a long process where they had venture capitalists as an angel company, then kind of grew, then more venture. So you might have three or four or five rounds of VC before you actually went public. And each round, you might have had a different contractual agreement with the venture capitalists. Some of you might have given options, warrants, all kinds of stuff. So by the time you go public, you've already committed to all of these equity claims. You've got to factor in those equity claims and you decide what the value per share is. And in terms of the pricing issues, almost every IPO, I said almost because we'll talk about the exceptions, goes through the same offering process. You put together an investment banking syndicate. The syndicate sets an offering price. It usually guarantees that price for a cost, which is you pay the investment bank 3, 5, 7% of the proceeds, and in return they say, we'll guarantee an offering price. File that away because you're the investment banker. You've guaranteed me a price. That's going to play a role in what that price is relative to what you think the value of the company is. Right? And finally, you have to remember that the game doesn't end on the offering date. Last week, Facebook's third lockup period ended. You know what a lockup period is? In most IPOs, the insiders, the VCs and the, and the founders, are not allowed to trade their shares for a certain period of time. It's a contract. It's not required by the SEC, or, but it's, a, it's an agreement that actually those people enter into with the investment banker. They say for six months, three months, nine months, we will not trade our shares. You know why they do it? What's a bigger, if you're an investor thinking about buying an IPO, you worry, right? You worry because this company's never gone public before never been public before. You worry that you might pay share for the shares of the company and be left with a shell. You know what I mean by the shell? Is the founders and the insiders cash out and they all leave and you have shares in a public company, there's nothing there. You worry about the fact that the offering price is set at this high level and it'll collapse the day after the offering. So to keep you from worrying, at least somewhat, I say, you know what, the owners and the VCs will not sell for at least six months. So if they, we're going to screw you over. It won't, won't happen for at least six months because you've got to keep the price up there. So it's, it's done because they want you to pay a higher price. It's not done through, uh, through altruism of, because they feel noble, but that's the way they get the highest price. So all those factors have to come into play. Let's see how each one can be worked out. Let's look at the proceeds. Here are the choices. 
When you make an initial public offering, the proceeds you can get can be used to do any one of the following. They can be taken out of the firm by some of the existing owners who are cashing out. They can be used to pay down debt and other obligations. The private company's accumulated debt and wants to take it off the books. Or most frequently, it's held as cash to meet, meet future reinvestment needs. So basically, you raise the money from the IPO. You put into a cash balance to meet your capex, working capital, because it's a growth firm. It needs that money for future reinvestment needs. Here's what you're going to do, depending on what the, what, what, what's chosen by the company. If it's taken out of the firm, then it doesn't affect your valuation. Remember that DCA value that I got for InfoSoft? If the entire proceeds are taken out of the firm, then I don't get a claim on it as an investor in the firm, so I'm going to say it's not mine. If it's used to pay down debt, here's how it's going to show up. Remember the debt ratio I used to my cost of capital? That reflected the existing debt ratio. If it's used to pay down debt, the debt ratio could be different. The cost of capital could be different. My valuation could be different. If it's kept as cash in the firm, then I have to add that cash on to the value that I got on the IPO. There's all this talk about pre-money and post-money valuations in IPOs. You say, what the heck are they talking about? The pre-money valuation of the IPO is what you got the minute before the IPO, which is you're valuing the company. The post-money is you've now made the IPO, you've brought an extra 5, 10, 15 million in cash. That has to be added on top of your existing valuation because that now belongs to you. It's on top of your traditional valuation. So in the case of InfoSoft, let's see how this would work out. We valued the equity in this company using the traditional DCF model at 70 million. Let's assume that 20% of the equity is going to be offered to the public on the opening day, on, on the opening, you know, on, on, on the opening of the IPO, and that 10 million of the proceeds will be held by the firm to cover future reinvestment needs. Okay, so whatever they raise by selling the 20%, 10 million is going to be left in the firm. The remaining is going to be taken out by the owners. I want you to come up with a value per share to attach to this IPO based on the DCF valuation and based on what I've just told you about what they're going to use the proceeds for. If they'd used all the, if all the proceeds had left the firm and there were 10 million shares, then what's the value per share? It'd be 70 million divided by 10, right? The fact that they're holding back 10 million means the day after the IPO, they're going to be worth 70 million plus cash, the 10 million, which is 80 million, divided by 10 million shares gives you $8 per share. Is everybody comfortable with where I got the $8 per share? So I'm taking the value, the DCF value. So with the IPOs, remember to do that. If you're issuing shares, your cash is coming in, and it's not being taken out by the owners, then it should be added on top of the DCF valuation. So your post-money valuation will be $80 million. Your pre-money valuation was $70 million. It's a very simplistic way of thinking about pre- and post-money valuation. But in IPO, you can see what that difference is. The cash that's come into the firm that now belongs to you as a stockholder. Any questions on that? Now, if you have other equity claims on the company, you have to do what we did with public companies. You have options outstanding. That's another claim on the equity. If you have venture capitals with special voting rights, that's another claim on the equity. You have to do what we did with public companies, value those claims, subtract them from the 80 million. So if I told you that venture capitals have the option to buy additional shares in this company at a fixed price, and I value the options at 5 million. You'd subtract the 5 million from the 80 million to get a value of equity in the company. So it's exactly what we did with public companies, but you have to read through the prospectus. Okay? My suggestion is if you get online, get, look at the Yelp prospectus, look at the Facebook prospectus. There are 100 pages. You're going to feel that this is a waste of time. But read through it because companies are usually pretty clear about what those prior claims are, partly because they assume that nobody reads these prospectus. They're actually very honest. They say, hey, you know, I'll put everything down. Nobody's going to read it anyway. So you can, you can beat them by actually reading the prospectus and figuring out what these claims are, valuing those claims, and subtracting it from your discounted cash flow value plus the cash held back in the company. Now let's, I'm going to let you play the fund role. Let's say you're my investment banker. You valued my shares at $8 per share, right? So you've gone through this process, done the DCF value, added the cash. As the investment banker, though, you're guaranteeing me the offering price. So if you don't deliver the offering price, 
then you've got to make up the difference. So what makes your job easier as an investment banker to set the offering price at $8 or sell it, set it at below $8? You're going to discount it, right? I mean, in fact, in finance, there's this big issue of, you know, they call it the IPO puzzle. What's a puzzle? You're the investment banker. You've guaranteed me a price. If I let you set the price, you're going to set it at below your estimated value, not at the estimated value, definitely not above. So you're going to discount it. In fact, if you go into investment banks and you look at the IPO manual that they give out, everybody who works in the IPO, it's very specific. There's value of the company, knock 15% off the value. They're very clear about it. You take 15% off the value. And not surprisingly, when you look at studies of IPOs, you find that on average, IPOs are discounted or the, on the offering date, the, uh, the price jumps by about 10 to 15%, reflecting the discount. In, so you, it's no puzzle to see why investment bankers do what they do. It's because they've given the guarantee. It's one reason why Google decided to bypass the investment banking process. You know what Google did, right, on their IPO? They did an auction. They said, why the heck should we leave 15% on the table? We're going to let an auction. You say, why couldn't every company do go? Google was unusual. It's a company that actually had a higher profile than the investment bankers taking it public. If you say, we don't need you. I think Facebook could have pulled that off if they really wanted to. It would have been a far smoother process if they'd done an auction instead of going through the fiasco that they did. But most companies don't have the choice. They have to use the investment banker, and the investment banker is going to underprice the offer. But let's look at what the real puzzle is. This seems like an easy money bet, right? If you're an investor, and on average, in IPOs are underpriced by 15%. Is there a way you could make money on this? What, what could you potentially do? You could actually get a list of every IPO that's going to come out over the next year. It's, a, it's, a, it's you know, fairly easy to get to. Then what are you going to do? You're going to apply for 10,000 shares in each IPO. You should make money, right? What's the pro? What, it, it's actually not going to work. People have tried it. What's the problem with trying to monetize this finding, trying to make money on it? You ask for 10,000 shares in every IPO for the next year. Are you going to get 10,000 shares in every one of them? I mean, if an IPO is underpriced, what does that mean? More people apply for shares than are being available, right? So the shares are going to be rationed. So if you ask for 10,000 shares, in the most underpriced IPOs, you'll get maybe 2,000. In the slightly less underpriced, you might get 5,000. In the overpriced IPOs, what are you going to get? You're going to get all 10,000 shares. In fact, the investment banker will call and say, would you like some more? Please don't say yes. If you're getting calls from the investment banker, it's going the wrong direction. But that's exactly what happens with people who try to take mo make money off it, is they end up overweighted in the most overpriced IPOs. And they end up underweighted in the cheapest IPOs. Doesn't mean that you can't make money, but if you're going to use IPOs to make money, you need a leg that you have to go through before you make that, that tenth. You actually have to go through IPOs and do what before you bid for them? You have to value the IPO on your own. You can't just take the IPO price as a given. If you're willing to do that, there might be a way you can make money, but then that's hard work, right? That's like valuing any other company. But that's something to keep in mind when you see IPOs. Don't be surprised to see the IPO pop on the opening day. In fact, what happened at Facebook was the exception rather than the rule. But the IPO pop is not an easy way to make money because of all the things that it comes with. Any questions? One final thing is um, on the IPO, if you're, if you're the owner of a public company, you can see why the underpricing might bother if you're offering all the shares. But if you're offering only some of the shares, as we said, you can stage, man you view this as kind of a lead into that lockup period ending. Okay, so in fact, I'm going to post on my website on just IPO lockups and the evidence and what happens when lockup periods end because a lot of, there are a lot of studies that on, on the offering date, but relatively few on what happens when lockup periods end. It's pretty interesting. On average, stock prices tend to drop about 1% to 3% when lockup periods end, but there's a lot of noise around that number. Last week, for instance, Facebook's lo third lock, lockup period ended and stock price jumped 13%. 
its previous two lockup periods, it dropped 5% each time a lockup period ended. So a lot of interesting dynamics when lockup periods end and insiders can sell their shares. 777 million shares for Facebook came onto the market last Wednesday. That's almost a third of their outstanding shares hit the market on that one day. And you're saying, shouldn't that cause the price to collapse? Not necessarily, because everybody knew it was coming. There was an expectation built in about what would happen on that day. It turned out that fewer insiders sold on that day than people expected. It turned out to be good news rather than bad news, which tells you how difficult it is to actually play this game because you've got to look at the expectations that people have around those days. Last private issue. Okay? You're looking at a private company that is really right now a small private business, but it has great plans. It expects to be a private business right now. For the next two years, the owner is going to provide all of the equity. But based on his expectations, in a couple of years, he expects to hit a venture capital. So in the first round, he's going to hit a, venture, a specialized VC who's going to provide startup funding. And then a couple of years later, he plans to go public. So basically, there's three stages in the process. First step, He's a private owner. He's completely undiversified. During that period, he's going to use the total beta. Why? Because he's completely undiversified. Second round, he approaches a VC who is partially diversified. And the way it's going to show up is, see this correlation? That correlation is really the correlation between your portfolio and the market. It's not the correlation between the company and the market. It's a correlation between your portfolio and the market. So the more diversified you get, the higher that number is going to be. So as you get more diversified, the beta is going to decrease. Beta decreases, the cost of equity goes down. So same company, your cost of equity is 24% for the first two years when you're the only game in town. It's 14% when you get that VC in the second round. And then when you go public, use a market beta, your cost of equity goes to 9%. So it's the same company, but what's shifting is the ownership of the company. So here's how it works out. I have the expected cash flows of this company every year for the next five years and beyond. The cost of equity, though, changes, not because the company is getting safer, but because the investors are getting more diversified. So it's a very different reason than why the cost of equity changed at Amazon. There, the company itself was getting safer over time. The market beta was decreasing. Here, the market beta is actually staying the same. But the beta that I'm using, the cost of equity is changing. because the owners change? So the cost of equity is 24% for the first two years, 14% for the next three and drops to 9%. So when I do my terminal value, that's my IPO valuation, 2.5 billion. But to discount back to today, I use the higher cost of equities I have in the first five years. That's my, that's my value based on using the correct discount rate. I've also estimated what the value would be if I screwed up. What would screwing up here be? If I use 24% as my cost of equity in perpetuity, as the company goes public, I'm going to undervalue the company. If I use the market beta as my cost of equity, all the way through, I'm going to overvalue the company. A lot, of I, a lot of these private company valuations, I think, either screw up in one direction or the other, is they don't factor in the expectation that the company's ownership will change over time. And as it changes, the cost of equity will also change. So here are my closing thoughts on private company valuation. The value of a private company would really depend on the motive for the valuation. You can't tell me the value of a private company is X without knowing why I'm doing the valuation. So if you're the seller of a private business, the highest value you will get will be to sell to a long-term rather than a short-term investor because that affects liquidity. A diversified investor rather than an undiversified investor. And basically, you want this person to think that you're incompetent. Why? Because then what kind of key person discount do they apply? They're so convinced that they can replace you. So when you're bidding, say, I'm terrible at this business. I don't know what I'm doing. So when I leave, the business will actually get more valuable because that will actually help you. It might not work because the other side is not stupid. So, you know. But you don't want to be talking about how good you are when you're selling the business. You want to be talking about how bad you are and how this business can replace you in no time at all. Right? If you're valuing a private business for legal purposes, you know, It'll depend on which side of the divide you're on. Are you working for the taxpayer or working for the IRS? Which discount you use? Which di so there's a lot of debate and legal issues about what the right thing to do is, but often it depends on what you're trying to do. Right? 
And as a final proposition, if you're the owner, if, if you're the owner of a private business, you have the option of investing your money in a publicly traded stock. The way we're valuing private business is by using that as a way of estimating what your cost of equity should be. Okay. Of course, you might get emotional dividends. You know what I mean by emotional dividends? You love running this business, and you're saying, oh, it's OK that I'm making less than I need to, which is fine. But at least be honest with yourself about why you're running this business. It's not because it's the best use for your money, but because it's the best emotional investment you can make. And you're OK with making less money than you should. So any questions on private company valuation? So if any of you have uh, friends or family who have private businesses, step in and try to value the business. I mean, not only will you be doing a service for that person, but it's actually a very interesting exercise in thinking about risk and whose perspective am I taking when I do this valuation, and how will that value be different depending on who's looking at this company. So let's start on packet three. Now, we're going to talk about real options. And much of what we're going to talk about is going to take option pricing as a base and build on it. Okay? I know you've seen option pricing in foundations. Some of, uh, anybody here taking futures and options? Right now? Right. So some of you are taking futures and options. But I'll be quite honest with you. Most people forget option pricing after they've just seen it. So if I ask you the basis for the binomial or the black shows, my guess is most of you don't remember enough to so what I'm going to do is give you a very quick 30-minute introduction into option pricing. Because we really can't talk about real options if you don't understand basic option pricing. So what I'd like to do for the rest of today's session is at least lay the foundation for the fun stuff. Because once you understand options, then we can talk about applying options. Okay? So I'm going to give you my perspective on real options, but I'll also tell you that I'm a skeptic when it comes to real options. I've always believed that option pricing has uses in valuation, but I've also be, I also believe that especially in the last decade or so, people have gotten a little carried away with real options. In fact, one of my biggest problems with the real options technology is the people pushing for real options in corporate finance, in valuation, there are lots of people pushing for real options, tend to be real options purists. They love real options. They want to apply them everywhere. And when I see what they do, I'm reminded of what Charlie Munger once said. He said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, after a while, everything starts to look like a nail. And that can be said about a lot of real options people. They're so excited about the tools that they want to use it everywhere. So one of the things I'd like to talk about is when is it appropriate to talk about real options and when is it overreaching? Because a lot of what I see out there as real options is really an attempt to put a name on what I call the elusive premium. You know what, I, what the elusive premium is? Something's worth 50. You're intent on buying it for 80. You want to pay, give that $30 a good name, right? You might have called it um, conglomerate. So, you know, some premium. You know, could be synergy. It could be. Uh, but right now, one of, the, one of the words that people use to justify premium pay is to call it a real options premium. Why are you doing that? There's a real option in there. Why are you investing in China? Because there's a real option in there. Why are you developing this new drug? Because there's a real option in there. Why are you doing this acquisition? Because there's a real option in there. So I want to talk a little bit about when real options make sense and when they don't. To do this, I'm actually going to go back to a very simple decision tree. Okay? Let's assume that you're investing in a project. There's a 50% chance of it succeeding and a 50% chance of it failing. If it succeeds, you make $100 million. If it fails, you lose $120 million. What's the expected value of this project? It's minus 10, right? Basically, the ex you know, 0.5 times 100. Per so this is a bad project. Now, I'm going to take the same project and present it to you in a slightly different way. Instead of having one branch, it's now going to have two branches. So you're going to, you're going to get one try. There's a 75% chance on that first try you're going to get a positive outcome. There's a 25% chance you're going to get a negative outcome. So plus 20, minus 20. If you get a negative outcome, you stop the game. If you get a positive outcome, then you do a follow-up. And in the follow-up, there's a two-thirds chance you get a positive outcome, in which case you make 80 million. And there's a one-third chance you'll get a negative outcome, in which case you lose 100 million. You know why, why I've set this up? What, what's the overall probability of success 
in this particular trial. Three quarters times two thirds is half, right? There's a 50% chance of success, and your cumulative upside is 20 plus 80, which is 100. There's a 50% chance of failure, and your cumulative loss is 120. In other words, it looks a lot like the previous example 50% chance of success, 50% chance of failure, plus 100 minus 120. But if you take the expected value of this tree, it's actually positive. You can try it out. So here's my question to you. This tree had a negative expected value. This tree has a positive expected value. What is it about the second tree that makes it more valuable than the first tree? What are you getting in the second tree that you did not get in the first tree? Well, let's not use the word option. We don't even need to bring out the heavy ammunition, right? What do you get? You get a trial, right? A trial run. And if the trial run doesn't work, you get to stop. There are two building blocks for real options. There's learning, and there's adaptive behavior. Let me explain. You learn from the first trial. And then you, what you do in the second round depends on what you learned in the first round. There's learning, and there's adaptive behavior. Let me, let me kind of flesh this out. One of the things we're going to talk about is the valuation of oil companies. In a traditional discounted cash flow model, here's how you value oil companies. You project out the expected number of barrels of oil you're going to produce each year. You multiply that expected number by an expected oil price to come up with an expected cash flow. But if you're an oil company manager, think of how you decide how much oil you're going to take out each year. What do you get to look at first before you make that decision? You get to look at the oil price. If the oil price is $25 a barrel, you say, this year we'll take out only 10 million barrels. If the oil price is $125 a barrel, you say, this year we're going to go for? In other words, the number of barrels of oil is not a fixed number. You, as the manager of the company, decide how many barrels of oil you're going to get. You learn by looking at the oil price, and you adjust your production based on what you learn. In a very you know, convoluted way. You know what I've just said? If you use a discounted cash flow model to value an oil company, you're going to undervalue the oil company. Because what you're missing is the optionality, which is more oil gets produced at a higher price, less oil gets produced at a lower price. That is the basis for the real options argument that using a traditional discounted cash flow model where you have learning and adaptive behavior will give you too low a value for a project or a company. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, I'm actually going to set up three questions I need to get addressed before I start using option pricing to value a real option. Okay? First, I'm going to ask, when is there an option embedded? When should I even be talking about options? Because I, uh, I think we talk about options in places where they don't even belong. So I'm going to go back to the basics of options and talk about when should we even talk about options. Second, when does that option have significant economic value? Put differently, are we wasting time and resources, something that's worth very little? If we are, then we shouldn't be wasting our time. We should just stop with the DCF valuation. And third, when can I use an option pricing model, whether it's binomial or Black-Scholes, to value that real option? When is there an option embedded in an action? When does that option have significant economic value? And when can I use an option pricing model? And here's what I'm going to give you as a preview. For every 100 options that you see out there, five will have significant economic value, and maybe one can be valued using an option pricing model. That's the one that we should be spending our time and resources on not all 100. So let's start with the first question. When is there an option embedded in an action? And to do this, let me go back and nail down the basics of options. Here are the things that make options options. First, an option is a derivative asset, right? It derives its value from something else. It's a leech. It needs an underlying asset. So if you tell me something is an option, then I'm always going to ask you a follow-up question. What's the underlying asset? You say, what? then it's really not an option. There's got to be something it's tied to. Second, options have contingent payoffs. Something has to happen for you to get the payoff. With a traditional listed option, the stock price has to be greater than the strike price. If it's a call option or less than the strike price, it's got to have a contingent payoff. So there's got to be an underlying asset. There's got to be a contingent payoff. And it's got to have a finite maturity. Options don't last forever. In fact, the best way to see if something is an option is to draw the cash payoff diagram. 
because we know what an option payoff diagram looks like, right? It's, very, it's fairly unique. An option payoff diagram for a call always has that kink around the strike price. If the stock price exceeds the strike price, you make unlimited profits. If it's less than the strike price, all you can lose is the price of the option. With put options, everything gets flipped around. You still get the kink around the strike price, but if the stock price exceeds the strike price, you lose the put. But if it's less than the put, you don't make unlimited profits, but you make pretty large profits. You, you see why it can't be unlimited? Because the price can't go below zero. So it's, it's floored at zero, but you could still make a lot of money. So that's what I'm looking for, is with every real options we're going to talk about next week, I'm going to draw the payoff diagram. And if it looks like one of these payoff diagrams, I'm going to say, well, I don't care what it's called, but there's an option embedded here. We have to bring out the option pricing methodology. So that's the starting point, is when is there an option embedded in action? Because only then should we be talking about option pricing. Second question, and this to me is the key question. In fact, even if you forget everything else we say about, about real options, I want you to remember one word, exclusivity. For an option to have value, you have to have exclusivity. You know what I mean by exclusivity? You and only you get the right to get whatever I'm offering with the option. I'll give you a story to kind of bring this home. It's about uh, five or six years ago, you know, second year MBA, taking this class, and he comes into my office very excited. He says, you know what? Uh, I'm renting an apartment. My landlord has given me the right to buy my apartment an option to buy my apartment. I want to value the option using a Black-Scholes model. I said, aren't you getting a little carried away here? He said, I've spent a lot of money on this MBA. I'm going to use it. I said, OK. Let's get started. Your landlord gave you the right to buy this apartment, right? And he said, yes. And I said, what price did he say? I thought about it for a while. And he said, I don't think he mentioned the price. I said, let me get this straight. Your landlord has given you the right to buy the apartment you're renting sometime over the next year, whatever the prevailing market price is. Is that what you have? He said, I guess that's what I have. He said, what do you think that option is worth? If I gave you the right to buy wherever you're living at the prevailing market price, what's special about you? Anybody on the street could do exactly the same thing. There is no exclusivity. If there's no exclusivity, there is no option. If he'd thrown a number on the table and said, you have the right to buy this apartment at 400000 then we can talk. But the right to buy at the prevailing market price has no exclusivity. So with every one of the real options, that's the question we're going to ask. Where is the exclusivity? And if you cannot come up with an answer, then I'm going to say, maybe we shouldn't be talking about options here. Opportunities are not options. I mean, a lot of people say, investing in China is an option. Why? Because it's a big market. True, it's a big market. That's an opportunity. But it's not an option unless you have exclusivity to that market. So that's the question, I think, where you have to think about, hey, is this really an option that I should be spending time in? Is there exclusivity? Because the minute you say there's exclusivity, then we can bring out the big, the big guns. Because we know, after 40 years of option pricing, what the variables are that drive the value of an option. So the risk of boring you by repeating what you already know the value of an option is determined by only six variables. And here are the six variables. Three relate to the underlying asset. As the value of the underlying asset goes up and down, the value of your option will also change. Call options will go up with the value of the asset. Put options will go in the opposite direction. Second, the more variance there is in that value, the greater the value of your option. We talked about this early in this class. Options gain from more risk. Why? Because the more risk there is, the more upside you get. You're saying, but there's also a downside. But with an option, remember, I've capped your downside, that floor of the payoff. So options are helped by risk. So the more uncertain you're about the underlying asset, the greater the value of an option. So the value of the option, the variance of that value. Any dividends you expect on the underlying asset will also affect the value of option. Here's why. Let's take a conventional call option on a stock. Let's assume tomorrow you, you expect a big dividend to be paid by this, on this company. So everybody knows the dividend is coming. The stock's at 50. The dividend tomorrow is going to be $2. Tomorrow is the X dividend day. So right after tomorrow, what's going to happen to the stock price? Remember, there's no surprise here about the dividend. Everybody knows it's coming, so there's no information. But the minute the dividend is paid, the stock price is going to go from 50 
down to 48. So if you have a call option on the stock, you know that tomorrow the stock price is going to drop. And if it's going to drop tomorrow, your call option will become less valuable. And your put option will become more valuable. So expected dividends on the asset will affect the value of call options and put options, making call options less valuable and put options more valuable. There are two variables relating to the option itself. One is the strike price. The right to buy something at a fixed price is worth more at a lower strike price than a higher strike price. The reverse is going to be true for a put option. And the more time I get give you to play this game, the more valuable options get. There's only one macro variable in option pricing models, and that's the level of the risk-free rate. And here's why it matters. If I give you the right to buy something at $50 two years from now, you don't have to wait two years. You can actually take the money and take the present value of that $50, put it into a risk-free investment today, so you have $50 two years from now. The present value of what you have to pay in two, in two years is going to be far lower if interest rates are high. So the risk-free rate is 10, 12, 15%. The right to buy something at a fixed price will get more valuable. You see why? Because that fixed price two years from now is worth less in today's terms put options will become less valuable because if you get that $50 two years from now. So interest rates can affect options with higher risk-free rates, making call options more valuable and put options less valuable. So let me review. Three variables relating to the asset. The value of the asset, the variance in that value, expected dividends. Two variables relating to the option, the life of the option and the strike price, and one macroeconomic variable, risk-free rates. You look at any option pricing model, you're going to see all six of those variables. So is there an option? When does that option have significant economic value? Third and final question. When can I use an option pricing model to value an option? Until 1971. You know how people valued options? They valued them like any other asset. They took the expected cash flows. They discounted them. They did traditional present value. What Black and Scholes changed was the way we think about options. They said, you don't have to value the option. It's a derivative asset. There are two building blocks that all option pricing models are built on. One is replication. The other is arbitrage. Sounds fancy, right? You know what the replication part is? You can create something that looks exactly like the option using the underlying asset and either borrowing or lending. You can create a portfolio that has exactly the same cash flows as the option. That's the first piece of every option pricing model. The second piece is once you create that replicating portfolio, since, since it has the same cash flows as the option, the two have to trade at the same price. That's the arbitrage. In fact, the best way to see replication arbitrage at play is not with the traditional black shows because it's kind of hidden. It's there, but you don't see it directly, but with the binomial model. And I'll go through this in a minute. But if you look at those two building blocks, replication and arbitrage, for those two building blocks to work, you have to be able to trade the option. You have to be tra able to trade the underlying asset. You have to be able to borrow and mo lend money at the risk free rate. right? Now, with a conventional listed stock, that's pretty easy to meet. You can trade the stock, you can trade the option, you can borrow and lend at the close to the risk rate. We're going to talk about valuing a patent as an option. Think about how difficult it is to trade the patent. Think of how much more difficult it is to trade the underlying asset, which is the cash flows that come from developing the patent. Neither the option nor the underlying asset are traded. It means you're on much more dangerous ground applying option pricing models to value a patent than valuing a listed stock. So when is there an option? When does the option have significant economic value? And when can I use an option pricing model? So very quickly, let me hit the basics of option pricing. If you go back to the, to the, to the fundamentals of, of options, you can create something that looks like the option using the underlying asset and borrowing and lending money. In fact, if you have a, if you have a call option, there is a replicating portfolio out there where you can come up with exactly the same cash flows as the call by mixing up the underlying asset and borrowing. If it's a put option, you sell short and you lend the money out. As I said, the easiest way to see this at play is with a binomial model. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a very simple binomial model so you can see the replication and arbitrage process at play. So let's say you have a stock. The stock right now is trading at 50. I give you a two-period option. So at the end of two periods, the option is going to expire. And here are the characteristics of the option. The option is a strike price of 40. It expires at t equal to 2. And the risk-free rate is 
and ask how much would you pay for this option? What's the minimum you would pay for this option? If you exercise right now, what would you make? Stock price is 50, the strike price is 40, so if you exercise right away, you'd make $10. So you know the, 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 the absolute minimum price is 10, but you're gonna be a willing to pay more than 10 because look at the end of two periods. Stock could go to 100, it could go to 50, or it could end up at 25. Here's the way to value the option. Start at t equal to two. It sounds backward, but start at the expiration of the option. You know why? Because you know exactly what the option is going to be worth at t equal to two. If at t equal to two the stock price goes to 100, you're going to get 60 because your strike price is 40. If it goes to 50, you're going to make 10. If it goes to 25, you have zero. Why, why don't you have minus 15? Because it's an option. I can't force you to exercise. You'd be dumb to exercise. The strike price is 40. So I know what the cash flows on the call are going to be at t equal to 2. You know what my objective is? To create a replicating portfolio that has exactly the same cash flows as the call. So let me go back one step to where the stock is 70, and let's see if I can create this replicating portfolio. I'm going to do a, a little very basic algebra. At the stock price of 70, let's assume the number of shares I have to buy is delta. So I have some patience because it's going to be abstract, delta. And the amount I'm going to borrow is b. So I don't know what delta and b are, but I'm trying to see what they are. If I go out and buy delta shares of stock and borrow b dollars, if the stock goes to 100, this is what my position is going to be worth, 100 times delta minus the borrowing with interest paid back, right? So 100 times delta minus 1.11 times B has to be equal to 50. If the stock grows to 50, 50 times delta minus 1.11 B has to be equal to 10. In other words, I'm trying to create a delta and B that have exactly the same cash flows as the call. Now do you see why it has to be a binomial model? You have two unknowns. Right? You don't know how many shares and how much you need to borrow. And we know from basic algebra that if you have two unknowns, the most you can have are two equations. So if you have three, a trinomial, you'll have three equations and two unknowns. God help you then. So the reason we picked the binomial model is because we're going to solve for two unknowns. So if I solve for the delta and B, this is what I come back with. Delta is 1, B is $36.04. You know, what does that mean? If I go out and borrow $36.04, the stock is 70, and buy one share of stock, I'm going to have exactly the same cash flows as buying a call option with a strike price of 40. Borrowing 36.04 and buying one share of stock means that I have to come up with $33.96 because I would borrow the 36.04 to get to 70. I need to come up with 33.96. That replicating position cost me $33.96. That's going to be the price of the option if the stock goes to 70. Now do you see why I start at the end and work back? I move back one step. I come up with the value of the option if the stock goes to 70. I do the same thing if the stock goes to 35. Do the, same, the equations. The value of the option is going to be 499. Now that I have the value of the options, I feed them back at t equal to 0. And if I solve at t equal to 0, here's what my replicating position looks like. I go out and borrow $21.61 and buy 0.8278 shares of stock. Don't even ask me how you do that you'll end up with a position that has exactly the same cash flows as the call at every stage in the process. That position cost me $19.42. That is the value of the option today. That's what we do in all option pricing models, is solve for the replicating portfolio, figure out how much that'll cost us, that becomes the value of the option. So you can see the basics of a binomial, but here's the problem with the binomial. At every point in time, your stock can jump to only one of two points, right? You take any publicly traded stock. To make that even possible, you have to make time really, really short. Because if I make time one day, think of how many possible prices you can end up with at the end of the day. So I have to make time maybe one second. You think, where is this going? Let's suppose I give you a three-month option, and I ask you to break time into one-second intervals, and I ask you to draw a binomial tree. This is torture, right? You have to draw little one-second trees. Let's say you had the patience to do it. You'd start with a really sharp pencil and a really big paper, and you draw a little, you know. So draw the entire tree. You're done with drawing the tree. Flip it over on its base. You know what it's going to look like? It's going to look like a pine tree without, a, you know, without the, the 
the, the base. Now smooth out the outsides. You know what you're going to end up with? You're going to end up with something that looks like a normal distribution. In other words, if you take the binomial distribution, you make time really small, and you make price changes really small. That's called a continuous price distribution. The binomial distribution converges on a normal distribution, and the binomial option pricing model becomes the Black-Scholes option pricing model. So the Black-Scholes is actually a limiting case of the binomial model if you make time small and price changes continuous. That's an assumption, though, because if you make price change times really small, prices can still jump in a second, right? We act as if it cannot happen. So the Black-Scholes model is built on the presumption that prices never jump. They move continuously. It's a big assumption of the model. It sometimes gets the model into trouble. Part of the reason the Black-Scholes model tends to undervalue D part of the money options. You see the link between the two? If you have a D part of the money option, the price has to move a lot, right? And in the Black-Scholes world, for the price to move a lot, it's got to move in small increments. So it tends to undervalue D part of the money option. But it's a nice, convenient model in terms of the distribution you end up with, because a normal distribution is so much easier to work with than a jump process distribution. So use the binomial model as kind of your starting point for understanding these models. Because if you take the binomial model and push it to its logical limit, you end up with the Black-Scholes. And in the original Black-Scholes, the value of an option was a function of five variables. S, value the underlying asset, the strike price, the risk-free rate, the time to expiration, and the variance in the value of the underlying stock. But didn't we just say there were six variables? What's the missing variable in the original Black-Scholes? Of the six variables we listed a few pages ago. Right, let's go back. We had six variables, right? What's missing in the original Black-Scholes? There's no expected dividend. You know why there's no expected dividend? Because Black and Scholes ran into a problem. They were trying to solve the model. They could not get a closed form solution. In fact, the paper sat around for a few months because they wrote out this model. They could not come up with a closed form solution. Until the rumor has it that a PhD student in physics who, stand, who happened to be wandering around the University of Chicago's offices came into their office and said, oh, we see this in first year physics all the time. There's this theorem called Ito's lemma, which we use. Which, and basically, that was the missing variable that allowed them to come up with the Black-Scholes model. But to make their life simple, the original Black-Scholes was designed to value what are called dividend-protected options. You say, what the heck is a dividend-protected option? Remember that example I gave you, the stock price is 50? Let's say the strike price is also 50. Tomorrow there's going to be a $2 dividend. The stock price is going to drop to 48. You're going to be hurt, right? But if you have a dividend-protected option, you know what I do to your strike price when there's a $2 dividend? Stock price drops by $2. I adjust your strike price by $2 as well. I see. You might say, look, I've never seen a dividend-protected option in practice. Neither have I. But they did this for convenience. By keeping dividends out, they were able to come up with their closed form solution. And in their original closed form solution, the value of a call option is the stock price today. It's never an expected future stock price. Stock price today times n of d1 minus the strike price times e minus. Let's face it, the Black-Scholes model forces you to use what I call your virgin buttons on your calculator. No, these are the buttons you never touch. The exponential, the natural log, all these buttons that have stayed new for the two years, black shows you get to use all of them. Right? But there's a reason for it. You know what the E minus RT is? What is, it, what is the role that, that E minus RT plays in the black shows? It's a present value factor. I tell people, if you don't have an exponential button, just take the present value of the strike price, you're going to get pretty much the same answer. It's just the continuous time analog to a present value function. So here's what I'm doing. I'm taking the stock price today times n of d1. You're saying, what's n of d1? n of d1 is actually an area under the normal distribution. It's a probability. The way to think about n of d1 and n of d2 is the probabilities. What drives the probabilities? S, K, R, T, and sigma. You're doing in the normal distribution what you did in the binomial model, but you're just doing it indirectly. So you're taking the stock price times n of d d1, Strike price, the present value of the strike price times n of d2, that gives you the value of the option. Last thing before we end uh, for the session. You know how you had the replicating portfolio in the binomial? The replicating portfolio is in the black shoals as well. The replicating portfolio for the call is to buy nd1 shares of stock. That's called the option delta. 
and to borrow the present value of the strike price times nd2. And if you do that, you created that delta and b that we solved for in the binomial model. You've just done it indirectly through the Black-Scholes. A lot of people use the Black-Scholes to get the option value. They forget that the real use of the Black-Scholes is in those numbers you get for s and nd1 and ke minus rt and nd2. Because those are the numbers we're going to use when we start talking about real options that are going to allow us to put some flesh on these real options. So have a great Thanksgiving break. I'll see you next Monday.